All right, folks, we're going to just go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the Undergraduate Research, the Office of Undergraduate Research Education Series. You're here all for the summer program for Undergraduate Research SPUR Faculty Mentors Info Session. We just want to remind you all this is a virtual event that is being recorded. So please mute yourself and turn off your camera to ensure an optimal experience. If you have questions, use the chat feature, um, or you can unmute when you're invited by Angie or myself. Self. Um, we're super excited to have you here. Um, and one thing we just want to share with you um, about the Office of Undergraduate Research is that our mission here at the University of Utah is to facilitate and promote undergraduate student and faculty collaborative research and creative works in all the disciplines throughout the University of Utah campus. We cannot do the work that we do without our faculty um, and also our supportive teams of staff, graduate students, postdocs, and other students who are part of the research enterprise. So we want to thank all of you for your commitment to supporting and facilitating undergraduate student participation in the research enterprise. Um, we do acknowledge the land that feeds and sustains us, which is named for the U tribe, which is a traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government and affirm our university's commitment to partner with Native nations and urban communities, Indian communities, through research, education, and community outreach. So um, I've been talking. You may be wondering, who am I? My name is Dr. Annie Isabel Fukushima. I'm the Associate Dean of Undergraduate Studies, and I have the honor of running the Office of Undergraduate Research. I am joined by two members of my team. I'm going to have my co-presenter uh, present herself first, Angie. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. My name is Angie Leva. I'm program coordinator here at the office, and I am so excited that you guys are all here to talk about SPUR. I'd also like to invite Shelly to introduce herself. She's not uh, co-presenting, but she is such a vital part of this process. So Shelly. Hi, I'm Shelly Parker. I'm the events manager for the Office of Undergraduate Research. So those beautiful videos that you see on our education series uh, website is because of Shelly, as well as all of the dynamic programming. Um, and so thank you, Shelly, um, for that. So welcome, folks. Um, we're here to talk about um, encouraging you to mentor undergraduate researchers in the summer. Um, and so why, why do that? Why mentor undergraduate researchers in the summer? Well, there's a variety of re reasons, um, and the research shows this, is that what we find is that when you, when faculty, um, uh, you know, mentor students, you are engaging those students in the research enterprise. Students don't just suddenly start doing research without the faculty mentors. And what we find is that it's actually much more meaningful for both the student and the faculty to have faculty involvement in the undergraduate research experience. Uh, the data shows that when undergraduate students participate in uh, research, it is a high impact practice. So they're more likely to be retained towards graduation. Um, and I'm happy to show off our numbers um, later on if you really wanna deep, dig deep into that. But 91% of our undergraduates who participate in our office's offerings graduate in six years. And, um, and it's around 64% uh, graduate in four years. So we know that our what when students participate in what we offer, they are more likely to be retained towards graduation. They have a community. They feel like they're part of the university. Um, and they eventually become ambassadors of the university because of the wonderful experiences they had with research. Um, it also supports students, uh, faculty, I'm sorry, it supports faculty who are doing research. We are an R1 institution and our commitments are to research. And, um, and so, you know, by having students participate in your research projects is a way to support your own research agenda um, because really we can't do everything. And sometimes it is really wonderful to have support along the way. Um, we know that many of us are training a next generation of colleagues. And this is a wonderful way to recruit students from across the fields, across life experiences into our dynamic fields is through undergraduate research. And so we know that's also a really positive benefit for our fields of studies. 
The other reason why uh, we really encourage our faculty mentors um, and uh, faculty in general to support undergraduate researchers is that, you know, when students participate in the research enterprise, they um, are really, and especially in what we offer here at the University in the, of Utah in the summer, they really do experience the whole breadth of the research enterprise from networking to uh, publishing information about publishing, presenting research. Um, and really the conducting research, we're going to leave that to you um, because you're the experts in your fields of study. Um, but those other professional developments, um, you know, they really work hand in hand with programming that Angie's going to tell you a little bit about later on. Um, that's super awesome. We wrap a ton around our students in the summer. So we know you're here because you're interested or you're intrigued. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what uh, about it. Uh, but a couple of things to kind of highlight Um how do we support summer undergraduate research here at the University of Utah? There's a variety of ways that actually faculty are involving students in their research activities. You may have your own grants uh, from NIH, NSF, uh, you may have an NSF REU, or you might have foundation funds. Um, and so what we encourage is our faculty budget for students, um, then that way they can be formally incorporated into your um, research projects. Um, and happy to provide consultation on that. Uh, faculty also have used their, um, you know, their research funds, uh, which has been super cool. Uh, we love when they do that to help their research efforts. Um, but the thing that we're going to talk about, and Angie's going to, um, you know, say a lot more about this, is we're here to talk to you about an offering that we provide to our faculty with the as the Office of Undergraduate Research um, through what we call our summer program for undergraduate research. And so um, we're super excited that you're all here to learn about what this is. I'm going to now punt it over to Angie, who is going to say a ton more. Thank you, Dr. Fukushima. Um, yes, like we have been discussing, we are here to go over the summer program for undergraduate research. Uh, we often shorten that to SPUR. So if you hear SPUR, this is what we're talking about. And so just so you all know more about SPUR, SPUR is a nationally competitive 10-week summer research experience under the mentorship of a University of Utah faculty member. And when we say nationally competitive, we really do mean that this is not only open to University of Utah students, it is open to eligible undergraduate students across the United States. And our office does recruit widely, and we will go more over that later. Um, but this program provides opportunities to gain research experience in a variety of disciplines. So just some overview of what the program is itself. SPUR does run... Uh, Summer 2025 SPUR will run May 19th, 2025 through August 1st, 2025. Um, it is a full-time program where students are expected to spend 35 to 40 hours a week on their research project with their faculty mentor. And then there's also program-related activities that the Office of Undergraduate Research uh, facilitates. And these activities include orientations, luncheons, Biweekly meetings to support professional development, our education series, which Shelly Parker, our events manager, she uh, helps run those in the summer um, all through the year. Um, and these are to support learning beyond the classroom, as well as we do have our graduate school preparation with the graduate school mini expo. Students also get to participate in research dissemination by presenting at the undergraduate research symposium at the end of the summer. And they also get to publish their work in Range, the undergraduate research journal. And so these student participants are hired as temporary employees by the Office of Undergraduate Research. Students receive a $5,000 stipend that is distributed throughout the 10 weeks um, as they work on their projects. On-campus housing is available to those students who need it. And so if students that are coming from out of state, they have a place to stay while they're here, um, you know, doing their research, as well as those students that do come from out of state and University of Utah students do get University of Utah ID cards. And this is really great because it provides them access to free public transportation, as well as university libraries. So all of this is really beneficial to them as they're here in the summer, um, you know, doing what they need to do as well as the Office of Undergraduate Research for non-university Utah participants, we do assist, we can provide a um, 
travel grant support. Uh, so that is up to $500 for round trip travel for those students that are relocating from out of the state to come to the university. And so the eligibility that we have um, for faculty to be SPUR mentors, uh, tenure and career line faculty at the U are eligible as well as postdocs. However, um, if you are a postdoc, we will just need, you know, evidence that you are able to be committed here to the U for the duration of the program. So, you know, as long as you are here through August 1st, 2025, and you're a postdoc, you will be eligible. Um, we Faculty can serve as for mentors for up to two consecutive summers. And this way we just get a chance to have really diverse faculty um, as, you know, we go through the years. And um, thank you for that, Angie. One thing I do want to say about the consecutive is you cycle off um, so others can pop in. You can always cycle back in. So you're not permanently uh, barred from coming back. We just want to make sure we give other faculty because it's very competitive an opportunity to apply to be spur faculty mentors. One thing I also want to say, um, Angie did not sell herself on how widely she recruits. Um, so she is literally reaching out to other AAU institutions that have recently research offices to invite their students to um, apply. And so last year, Angie, how much was it? Over 600 students applied. How much was it? We had 650 students apply. Yeah, no small number. Um, so 650 students applied to work with our faculty here at the University of Utah. So super cool work that Angie is doing to support our faculty here. Um, and so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, it, you know, we're assuming you're all here because you are interested in being a SPUR mentor. So thank you. Or, you know, someone who's interested and you are here to facilitate that as well. So thank you, um, you know, for showing up to this. So a couple of things about the application requirements um, is that you do need to provide a project background, which is like, what are, what are you doing research on and why is it important? Um, you also need to be very specific about the student's role in the project. So what would the student be working on if they were accepted to um, be your SPUR mentee? We also ask for student learning outcomes and benefits. Um, so how will this benefit the, this experience specifically benefit the student for their future? Um, whether that's co-authorships, joint presentations, or specific skills um, that they will have or other professional development. Keep those things in mind, folks. We also want to know your mentoring philosophy because this really matters for the Office of Undergraduate Research, and we'll talk about how we select our faculty in a little bit, um, but we want to know about what kind of mentoring you will offer, right? Some may be doing multi-level team mentor models, but really spell that out, what that looks like, um, and what kind of support should the student expect from you? Um, and so we really want that really deepened and low, low order issue, but hey, folks, please do not do diminish the importance of a photo submission, because should you be selected for to be a faculty mentor, then what we do is we use this very photo for our promotional materials. And so um, Angie knows that while I love you all standing in a line, we would love, love, love any more action, you literally in action doing research, uh, would love those action photos if you have them. Some of our fields look really different. Um, and so, um, you know, in the project background, we really invite you to describe your specific research and work um, and highlight why this is innovative, right? We know you're all innovating. Um, you're all at the cutting edge of research. Um, but we want you to explain that to the student who's going to look at your uh, research um, project. Um, ensure that it speaks to a wide range of students, right? And so one of the things is that while you may desire cer certain kinds of students who have fundamental skills, uh, we really do see this as the training part of the program. And so you should assume that they're coming in with no skills, right? You're going you're gonna to get them up to speed. Um, but if they do need to have some fundamental basic skills, um, that should be clear. Um, and limit your use of jargon um, as well. Um, one of the things we want to keep in mind is this is speaking to a committee of folks who will select the project, but the language will also speak to students. So actually keep those students in mind, getting them excited, interested, and in understanding what you're, you're working on so they want to apply to be your mentees. Um, and so our students, uh, as well as students across the country, will be reading and deciding to apply to be your SPUR mentee. 
Um, and so those are some of the things that we want to just say there. Many of you are really used to apply, uh, you know, describing research projects. So we know you know how to do this. Just maybe, you know, um, redesign it just a little bit, repurpose it with students in mind, since usually many of your project descriptions might speak to your faculty or colleagues. Um, and so that's a little bit about the project background. So mentoring philosophies are really important to the office. Uh, we really um, love supporting and connecting. It's in our mission statement, faculty um, and student, uh, faculty and students to each other. Um, and we believe that everyone has a philosophy and something that is gu guiding why and how they go about mentoring students. Um, and we want you to share that so students can see you and the kind of mentor you will be in supporting them. Um, and so this is an important part. Be specific about the concrete activities the students will do. Um, show enthusiasm in your words, right? Um, and highlight the experiences they may have that could go beyond the summer, right? And so um, professional development skills um, to if they're interested in applying for graduate school. Um, but, you know, also um, if you have clear expectations, we want you to be clear in your communication as well in this kind of um, uh, description. And so uh, really mentoring philosophies are important. We invite you to really think deeply about them um, and use up every word in the, the word limit. Uh, so you say more than less because um, our students uh, will be reading this um, and students in general. So we're going to look at some mentoring philosophies as examples. So it's not all abstract. Um, and uh, after that, we'll talk a little bit um, about research mentoring models and the selection process, and then we'll kind of pause for questions. So if you are, if you have a burning question that's coming up, you know, just know there's going to be some time for it. So we're going to look at Bradley King, who is an assistant professor in College of Health, um, as um, as an example of this is where the mentor philosophy goes. So you'll see here's a project description, right, um, that is provided. Um, as the world's population becomes increasingly older, there's a critical need to develop and implement interventions capable of minimizing the negative consequence of aging on cognitive function, right? Um, so a little bit of, you know, aging hippocampus, right? Maybe some students that might be jargon for them, but you start to see in the description here, uh, Bradley's driving home the importance, right? This is an important pro uh, project. Um, also goes into specific um, information around the student role, including that this student will be part of a lab. We know that not all of you have labs. We're not requiring labs. You don't need to be in research teams. You don't need to have like a research hub or whatever. But if you do, not a, not a bad place to plug it, right? Because the student will be incorporated into it. Um, as well as um, here you might find some examples of student learning outcomes, right? Um, they'll receive training and research ethics and good clinical practices because this is a clinical research right um, project. And that's actually something we um, remind our faculty when you are applying to be faculty mentors, if they need IRB training, if they need to be certified in HIPAA, um, if they need animal studies um, certifications, the list goes on. Uh, we're going to put it on you to know what kind of training they need to hit the ground running, right? And so these are things um, you should really be specific about about student who's applying if they've already done that training they can also then share that right um and so then you start to be like oh this one looks like they have some stuff under their belt again not a requirement folks because it is your job to train them so don't worry um, but it might be something that you um might look for um depending on your project and project needs um, here, uh, if we look at um, Professor King's um, description of his mentor philosophy, right, um, he says, as a mentor, I aim to find an appropriate balance between providing hands-on guidance to help students achieve their goals and giving enough space for students to make progress towards becoming independent researchers, right? So speaking to students who, you know what, there's going to be some kind of independence. You're going to have to do things and circle back to your faculty mentor. We're not going to be there holding your hand for the 40 hours, right? Some some faculty may have more hands on regularly eat meat, um, you know, many times throughout the week, they might meet every day. Um, some of our faculty might bring in other people and have those people be touch points every day and the faculty comes in in a different regular way. Um, and so 
here you'll see um, it includes a communication style as well as um, the kind of mentoring philosophy and how the mentoring will happen. Uh, so really great. Good job, Professor King, uh, for being selected. A really good um, example. Uh, let's take a, take a look at Dr. Jake George, who is in the College of Engineering. And hey, fun fact, folks, did you know that Professor Jake George was also a Spurs scholar who then left and then came back and became faculty and now is recruiting students? So cool. Um, I think that's so awesome. Um, we need to do a story on Professor George um, around this. Um, and so um, you might want to look at his um, here. Um, he has quotes, how like drawing you in with a quote from the get-go, right? Um, and then also talks about the sort of research team the student will be involved in, that there are 12 undergraduate students currently, right? So getting a sense of scale, right? Some you're working in bigger scales. That might not be good for some students who are more about like, I need the intimate one-on-one. -on -one. I want smaller mentoring dynamics. Some students might find a team of 12, like, wow, that's a party, right? So that's really good to share that. That kind of information. Um, and it is also very um, specific about the kind of mentoring activities that'll happen and the outcomes to the student. Um, and um, sorry, pop your collar, Professor George, they have 40 undergraduate students who have, you know, achieved 22 co-authorships. If you have stuff like that, you're welcome to show share that. You're not required, right? Um, it, it you're really pitching yourself to students, though. So keep that in mind. You you want to really sell the kind of opportunities that you can provide them, or you'd be excited to provide them. We, you are not required to have done all of this, right? It varies by field. We know some fields have more quantitatively more numbers of publications. You kick them out like twenty a year. Some of us, it's a little slower because our work's a little bit different. So we know that. Um, and so that's just some examples. And then uh, we also have an example from Professor Munoz um, in the Culture and Social Transformation, my colleague who did um, oral history um, projects with students, right? Um, here, really hitting at home, right? Constructing Latinx identity as a research focus in the Intermountain West. So catchy titles um, and is talking about what the student will do here. Right. Um, it's cool because he also opens up like he's been working on this for a while. Right. And so the student learns immediately. You're coming into something that's been, hey, cool. It's been going on for a while. How awesome. Um, and so lists other kinds of collaborations that are happening that the student would be a part of. Um, as well as has a wonderful list. We love bullet points, makes it clear for students to find information. You don't need to paragraph everything. Um, if you want to write in paragraph, you are a poet, you know, totally go for it. This is not the style, required style, but it helps students to find information quickly, keeping them in mind um, and all of that. Um, and so those are just some examples of faculty um, uh um, successful uh, proposals. Um, and so I'm going to keep going through and then we're going to pause for questions. Uh, but one of the things we just want to remind you is that you have very diverse research mentoring models and we just want you to own it. Don't run away from it. Students having diverse choice of options of the kind of mentoring they could apply for is important. Um, and that one of the things um, uh, if you have multiple mentors, one of the things that's come up as a question is, so, hey, what if it's another faculty, right? Another colleague on campus. You can name those colleagues if that makes sense in that space or name that lab or research team they're a part of so students can see the many faculty that are part of this. Um, and then also what I would encourage if you are doing research teams that include other faculty um, is you, in you include them in co-authorships and you name them as presenters in other presentations and outputs. Um, um, but for the application, uh, sorry, folks, we can only have one lead faculty. Uh, you know, we can't have multiple um, leads, um, even though we know in some fields that may be your spirit of collaboration is join everything. Uh, but at the end of the day, the student will be reporting up to one person. So if a issue comes up or question comes up, we kind of need to streamline communications to one person. So we're not like we need to like involve 20 people, right, uh, for this thing. Not that uh, things always come up and we can always talk about any challenges that might come up. But really quickly, we want to talk about the selection process. Um, so, um, you know, faculty are selected uh, competitively for the this coming cycle, we will select 25 faculty for summer 2025. Uh, they will be scored according
learning to strength around the information they provide with regards to learning outcomes and mentoring philosophy and the specific activities. Um, and then it goes under review by our um, undergraduate research advisory council um, who makes final um, uh, green light determinations for who should be selected. So there's uh, two levels of review that happens for faculty selection. Um, there is also a purchase option, uh, which then you don't have to go through the uh, review part. You are going into an agreement with the office. Uh, we do an MOU. Um, Angie can always set that up with uh, for you to meet with me if you'd like to talk about that. But if you'd like to just go ahead and purchase a spot, it wouldn't be one of the 25. It would be in addition to the um, 25. So don't worry, you won't be taking somebody's spot. It would be a whole separate thing. If you want to use your own funds, your research funds or any other federal funds that you have or foundation funds, you're welcome to use your funds and partner with the office. We have examples of many program partners that we do that with from Happiest um, to Realm to Reach You To. Like there's many kinds of partnerships that we can go in. We've even done it with individual faculty who just wanted to purchase one spot. Uh, and we really welcome that. But just as a friendly reminder, if you're thinking about doing that, so we know how many students we are supporting in the summer directly um, through the HR process. And by we, I mean, Angie, Angie's really supporting all of them. Angie needs to have a sense of scale. So she really does need you to communicate your interest so we can MOU very quickly by March 1st. Um, and so you could uh, do both. We've had faculty do both where they apply to be spur faculty mentors and say, no matter what, I want to do this. And I also want to use my funds for a student. So if I can use funds, I'd like to have an additional student. And if I don't get selected, those funds will just go to one student or whatever number of students they can cover. So we're we're super open to the kind of partnership on that. Um, some of the things we just want to make sure that you are aware of is the OUR program partners. So should you formalize a purchase of spot, uh, then you will be invited by Angie to the program partners um, where we meet regularly to share knowledge um, and, and discuss the kind of challenges that faculty and research teams and staff may experience with supporting undergraduate research. We see this as a real important space to try to address any kind of gaps in supporting of our students because um, we really want to ensure that our students have transformative undergraduate experiences through research. Um, and so before we go into the let's talk about what's next, you all, we've sold you. You are like, yes, 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 sign me up. Um, let's go ahead and pause for questions. Angie, what questions uh, have faculty, do faculty have specific questions? Yes. So we have a question from Samantha. Do research projects need to be on site or can we offer virtual flexible research in that would not require students to be on site in the summer? Our students are required to be in the state. Um, so they have to be because of our HR policies, um, they have to be on site. Um, and so one of the things that we really encourage is that there is um, on-site experience. Some of our students who have found that their faculty disappear quite a bit in the summer, which we understand our faculty travel. We're not telling you to never travel and not do your thing and all that, but really um, it may impact your students' experience. So you should kind of think about, is this the right summer for you then? Um, or is this the right opportunity for you? And if you're more of a, you want to do this, uh, you'd rather be on site um, in the academic years, then there's always Europe. Um, and we also do other kinds of agreements with different centers um, to support student integration in the research. Um, and so it really is up to you. Um, but what we know about our student experiences is they're more likely to have a positive experience when they're regularly engaged with their faculty and they feel like they're in community with them, as well as we're doing the um, other kind of programming. And Angie um, talked about the biweekly meetings that do professional development. Uh, what we also do that Angie coordinates is the summer socials. And so we'll be doing all that fun stuff, development stuff, but really the research, um, you know, kind of accountability. 10 weeks goes by fast, right? And so really want to provide the best environment for supporting an undergraduate researcher to pick up all the things they need to do 40 hours a week uh, doing research for you. Um, and so, uh, yeah, HR requires the students on site. If the faculty's not as frequently on site, it may impact their experience. Um, 
And we do um, expect our faculty, we can't require you, but we know we've had students who've been deeply disappointed when their faculty are not able to show up to the, um, the luncheon where we launch and introduce everyone to each other, as well as at the Undergraduate Research Symposium where they work so hard to put together a poster presentation. We um, have, um, we invite poster evaluators um, and so Shelly coordinates all those logistics, um, as well as we, um, this coming summer, we are going to have poster prizes. Um, and so we're going to have little, uh, cute little ribbons and all of that fun stuff and money, students getting paid for their prize. Um, and so uh, it really does, um, I think, strengthen and foster the, the relationship in a positive way if their mentor shows up. It's very meaningful for the student. And the faculty is like, how cool this, I mean, our, our symposium are really cool. So we're really sad when you miss it. Cause it's actually really awesome. Um, next question, Angie. Yes. Um, this is from our registrants who submitted beforehand. Are there any restrictions on research areas? No, because research is academic freedom. So we do not restrict research. Um, it is um, it is really based on selections are also based on trying to do field diversity and the way field diversity is determined is by college diversity as well. Um, and we know that within colleges, you are very diverse in your disciplines, praxis, ideologies and whatever. Right. There's a lot of things happening in a single college. Um, and so we do our best to select diversely across the colleges and also um, then get council, uh, council feedback to ensure that they see that diversity as well. Um, but yeah, it's uh, there is no restrictions because it is research. Um, and so uh, whatever you think, if your stuff is going to excite students, we wanna invite you um, to join this. Other questions? Yes, we have a couple in the chat. We have one from Julia. Can students work on multiple projects if all the projects fall under the same topic area? Yeah, um, you would have to put that in your um, proposal, in your description. And I'm going to tell you right now, you have word limits. Um, it may confuse the student. Um, and one of the things is that we really don't want you to be sad if you don't have that many students selecting you because when they look at what you're offering, it looks overwhelming. And so um, while I would encourage you to say, focus on one and then um, say there's a possibility that they may be able to work on other projects of interest that are connected to it. But I wouldn't overwhelm a student. Um, otherwise, you may find you're not going to get a lot of applicants. Angie, is that, does that sound about right? Um, yep. Yeah. Um, great. And then uh, was there another question? Sorry. Yes. We have another one in the chat. Can I have a graduate student co-mentor with myself as the faculty? Would mm -hmm. I add that to my application? Oh yeah, um, you can add that to the um, under the um, the the kind of the mentoring philosophy. You can add uh, uh, how you, that might look there. It's up to you where you want to put it um, in your application. Um, but you can add a graduate student in there if you want. Um, I think that one of the things is. Um, uh, does it matter who people are specifically or like, I mean, because there's like really limited word space that you're going to find here. And so what I would suggest is uh, maybe name the kind of mentoring philosophy that you have. And if it includes graduate students and other people, that should be clear. If you think that this like this person, because what you're saying when you name people in your descriptions is you're saying, this is the selling point, folks. You should know who this person is, right? Um, and so um, it's just something to think about in your kind of word limit, because uh, these are students who are going to be reading and applying for many summer undergraduate research experiences across the country, right? We are not the only, uh, you know, show in town folks. There are many others that we are competing with. And so we want to make sure that we are competing in an intriguing, positive way to students across the U.S. Other questions, Angie? Yes. Uh, the other question in the chat is, what if the project will not be completed by the end of the student's involvement on August 1st? 
Uh, no project is completed in 10 weeks. I can tell you that. Um, everything is ongoing research and you should just frame that for your research mentee as part of how process works. The question will be, will they be involved in it afterwards? And can you have agreements to keep them involved in some way? I think students love that. They may not be able to be in the day to day. You won't be able to keep them employed. But one of the things and Angie's going to talk about is some other opportunities to continue that relationship. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about how you can continue supporting students after after the summer um, is over but no research happens in 10 weeks is completed if it does you are amazing um, that's amazing yeah we have another question about how are students selected for the program Oh, that's a great question. I'm going to pump that to you, Angie. How are students selected? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll talk more about uh, student application deadlines and that uh, further on in the presentation. But yes, yeah, students do submit an application and it is through InfoReady. And so aside from just getting like basic information from them, you know, their name, their address, things like that, students also part of the application submit um, two letters of recommendation. They submit um, a copy of their transcripts and they do submit a personal statement. And so once the student application deadline uh, passes, um, we then create application packets. So um, part of the application is that students do get to pick their top three choices of faculty that they would like to work with. We then create, you know, um, create those application packets and we disseminate them to the faculty that the, you know, the students selected. Um, faculty then have the opportunity to review those and then you know, they can submit their recommendations of their top students that they would like to work with. And then the Office of Undergraduate Research um, with you know, Dr. Fukushima, we do go over you know, your recommendations as we go over the students' applications as well. And then you know, we make determinations off of that. That's a great question. So Angie, should we get into the next part since there may be more questions about that? And then uh, we can open it up again at the end for more questions. Yeah, so Angie's going to talk about uh, you're intrigued, you're going to apply. Now what? Okay. Yeah. So just so you guys are all aware, oh, the application for mentors is open right now. The deadline to apply is October 4th at 5 p.m. And if you are wanting more information, please follow the link. It'll take you to the application as well as all of this information we've also gone over here um, just so you guys get a sense. And you can also review other faculties, you know, projects. So you can go view SPUR faculty, um, you know, mentoring philosophies, project descriptions, student roles from our uh, 2024 faculty just to kind of get a sense of what other people have submitted and what, you know, um, a successful uh, application proposal looks like. And so for students, applications, we will be opening that um, on November 1st, 2024. And then the deadline for students to apply is January 26th, 2025. And if you, uh, some of you might be familiar from, you know, how we've done things previously, we are changing it slightly. Um, before we used to have two separate deadlines for student applications. The We had one deadline that was for the application itself. And then a week later was the deadline for the students to submit um, their letters of recommendation. Um, now it is just one singular deadline. So January 26, 2025, students will have to have completed, you know, completely submitted their application and get their letters of recommendation submitted at the same time. And so students will be able to review faculty projects um, no, starting November 1st. So after the Office of Undergraduate Research makes their selections on faculty, they will be added to our website where students can review it before they apply. And then there'll be links for them to just apply directly, you know, if they're liking what they see with the projects. And so we talked a little bit about this. There are additional resources, especially for those that might be interested in continuing um, research, you know, beyond the summer. And so um, one of those opportunities is the Undergraduate Research Opportunity Program, Europe. Um, you might hear that one more. <laughs> we used to be the Europe office, um, so that's what a lot of people knew us as before. Um, but Europe does provide undergraduate students and mentors the opportunity to work together on research or creative projects. And so students that are selected um, for Europe are hired as temporary employees by the Office of Undergraduate Research, and they are paid a $1,200 stipend 
to do 120 hours worth of research or creative work during the semester. And I'll tell you the same thing that I tell students. Sometimes when you hear 120 hours, that might seem a little daunting. Um, but when it kind of you break it down, it actually comes out to somewhere between like five and 10 hours a week. Um, and so it's, you know, totally manageable students and faculty can kind of work on a schedule. Part of the application is you guys work on a timeline. So you and your student work on a timeline and figure out, you know, how many hours that student will be committing every week to the project. Um, students are able to apply for Europe at any semester and they are eligible for a one semester renewal. Um, if you student, if you know of a student or you want to work with a student for Europe, just uh, be aware for the upcoming spring 2025 deadline. Um, that application will be due November 11th, and you can always find more information about the application, as well as we do provide resources for students to see, you know, um, proposals and renewal application examples. So if they need to get an idea of what they should be submitting, we have lots of helpful information on our website. And really quickly, Angie, it's November 1st. Oh, um, sorry. Think, yeah. <laughs> Thank no you. No worries. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. It's Angie's favorite number is November 11th. No yes. worries. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah. Um, great. So those are another opportunity. Um, and we see there's a question in there. Um, somebody says, I already submitted my application. Is it still possible for me to edit it? Angie, is it possible? Uh, yes. Please reach out to me personally. Let me just so I am aware that you will be, you know, resubmitting. You can resubmit the um, your application from what you did submit. Just like I said, let me know so then I know which application you would like us to, you know, formally review. Great. So we're going to go ahead and just uh, remind you of how to contact the office at our.utah.edu. You can email us at our at utah utah.edu or you can give us a call and somebody from the team will answer your questions 